um, is so honored to have you here and as well as Secretary um, Miguel Cardona. Um, you've both been so engaged with City Colleges and the work and multiple visits to Chicago and so we just can't thank you enough um, for also participating um, in this day. A partner that is that deeply engaged with you, you know, and their colleagues in the industry who they're talking to all the time are going to look and say, they've got a great curriculum. They've got incredible students. And the conversation is very different. It's how do we, the company, <laughs> adapt to the possibility of this talent, right? And so a lot of that work, quite frankly, if we're doing what we need to do on the curricular side and the student support side, is more about what the companies need to do to adapt and change in order to be good receivers of our students <laughs> and good mentors and coaches for our students to succeed in their environments, which you know, is, is not always so easy, right? Um, these, uh, uh, many of these companies have followed the pathway of taking uh, interns, not apprentices, but uh, in their junior or senior year of college. And we're asking them to look at things a little differently and bring students in uh, as freshmen as we do at Aon or as near graduates as we do at Accenture, right? And so a little different for every company, but this is a departure from what they've done in the past, which is you know, just focus on students with four-year degrees. By the way, um, we're extending that same concept in our partnership with the Chicago Public Schools in something we call Career Launch. So we're asking those same employers and others, you know what, uh, we appreciate that you're working with community college students, but we have these other community college students. They happen to be in high school, <laughs> but they're community college students, and we'd like for you to take them as well, right? And so part of this is uh, it's an adaptation in the private marketplace that is occurring. And that's why we're so delighted that, uh, you know, First Lady Jill Biden came with, you know, Secretary Cardona and Secretary of Labor and, you know, Secretary of Commerce, um, because we do need that push and that encouragement that comes from our national leaders to make sure that uh, these companies do the hard work of inclusion. So, you know, this is part of your agenda to get your students to a family sustaining wage. And, you know, one major obstacle to that is oftentimes uh, student loans, right? Like whether it's two year, four year, often the transition to four year brings on additional loans. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening at the, the national agenda around you know, affordability and access? Yeah, well we have a higher education system now that's heavily financed by debt. And even over the last uh, decade or two, there's been a change. So for young people today, um, even when you graduate and you get that job, you're struggling to repay your loan and can delay your efforts to buy a home or start a family. And for people who uh, don't graduate, which is about one in three borrowers, um, you're left with debt but no degree. Um, other students may have a low quality degree uh, or may have studied something that wasn't intended to provide a financial return. So there are a lot of things where the student loan model is not really working. And prior to the student loan pause, uh, we had a million people a year defaulting on their student loans, overwhelmingly uh, uh, Pell Grants recipients, first generation college students of color. Um, so we've been working very hard to try and clean up the student loan system. Of course, President Biden uh, is working to cancel up to $20,000 in student debt, and the Supreme Court will uh, hear a case on our authority to do that uh, next month. Uh, we've been working really hard to make sure that students who are already eligible for loan forgiveness are getting it. So we've found about two million borrowers who are eligible for forgiveness because they've been in public service for 10 years or they were cheated by a for-profit college or they had a permanent disability. We've been able to speed those people through the bureaucracy and get them in line for loan forgiveness. Um, we also have proposed a new student loan repayment plan that is substantially more affordable. It bases payments based upon your income. If you're a single person making less than about $30,000 a year, you wouldn't owe any payments at all. And overall, for people in about the bottom third, it would reduce payments per dollar by about 80%. So it's a very meaningful expansion in college affordability, especially for low and middle income borrowers. So uh, the last piece of this is we need to look at where all this unaffordable debt is coming from. 
And a big part of it, a disproportionate part of it, comes from uh, low-quality for-profit colleges. We're working very hard on accountability there. And we're also talking to the community about new research efforts about other kinds of, um, uh, of places that leave students with high, with high amounts of debt they can't afford, and to think about whether there are other strategies for financing higher education other than those deep, deep uh, amounts of debt. And Chancellor, you mentioned the STAR scholars specifically, but will you talk a little bit more? There's a number of other efforts you have around alleviating the stress on, on students at City Colleges. Yeah, well, well, first of all, we've, we've really worked hard at City Colleges to make our overall tuition accessible and affordable. Um, we're one of the few institutions, if not the only one, that uh, does not charge fees. So we have a base price for our tuition. Uh, and uh, we've kept that steady for the last seven years. That's not, you know, sustainable far into the future. Uh, but, uh, but we look at it every year, right? And we make sure that we're being thoughtful uh, about our overall pricing structure. So number one. Number two is, you know, when we can, we found ways to make college uh, not just affordable, but at no cost, free, right? Um, and so we did that with STAR Scholarship. If you get a B average, community college is completely free to you, graduating from Chicago Public Schools. Largest cohort ever, it, right? We had the okay. largest yeah. cohort ever this year, uh, and that has just grown every year that we've had the STAR Scholarship. What happens is students talk, <laughs> and they say, wow, you know, I got the STAR Scholarship. I went to City College. I transferred to Northwestern. I transferred to UIC. I transferred here. I transferred there. And by the way, when I graduated, I had this much in debt rather than that much in debt, right? Um, or as one parent said, I won the lottery, right? <laughs> because they didn't pay anything. They came through us on scholarship and then they went to the four-year university on scholarship. So, uh, so we saw that working for high school students. But on the other hand, during the pandemic, we understood the need for folks to recover economically uh, and to enter into those high demand occupations where our employers were, you know, and are looking for talent. And so we created something called Future Ready, uh, which is we took uh, our, our, uh, our, our short-term programs that are in high demand in the marketplace, and we made them free to any Chicagoan. Uh, and uh, guess what happens when you do that, right? People that have not been uh, in higher education they think for a minute, oh my goodness, this is my shot. <laughs> and they start to take their shot, right? So it's been 78% uh, black and brown students. Uh, when you look at where the students are coming from, they're coming from the very neighborhoods uh, that uh, you know, have been hit hardest by COVID and you know, economic downturns in the past and in the present. And so you know, these kinds of efforts you know, really uh, make a difference. By the way, we've used federal funds for this, but I will say it today, and I've been saying it for some time, Future Ready is here to stay at the City Colleges of Chicago, okay? Um, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, okay, audience members, um, please remember, start writing questions if you haven't done it already, and those will be picked up um, throughout the audience. Um, you know, Under Secretary, we're here today, obviously, to focus on this, um, the learning agenda and these type of relationships with research and this transparency. Um, we recently had a trustee retreat, and we heard about continuous learning, I think, throughout the entire retreat and just how deeply it is embedded here. Do you see that, um, those types of partnerships across the country? Is this unique? Is this something you're seeing more of? It's something, can you incentivize something like this you know, for others to take on? Because we're just seeing the power of it here. I think it is uh, still unusual. I would say that you know, among the places that are really doing this work, um, I see three things and that here at the City Colleges too. First is you know, having a different expectation about what students can accomplish. And we need to set aside the whole on your left, on your right, you know, there's still, I think, some remnants of thinking that if a lot of students are failing, that's, of course, that's a, that's a rite of passage or a sign of its rigor. And we need to be thinking about how we help many more students succeed and suspect, expect all of our students to succeed. The second is um, trying to build a real uh, culture of belonging or a sense of community. 
and there are a lot of ways to do that. It can be through formal advising programs like OMD, it can be through uh, peer cultures, it can be through faculty, but everyone needs to be able to see themselves as the kind of person who belongs at college and can succeed at college. And then the third thing is the use of data. Um, you need to take a look at the numbers and figure out where a student falling through the cracks, what are the roadblocks, and sometimes it is a course, uh, sometimes there are just big equity gaps in a course, can be the ways in which we communicate with students, it can be lack of coordination between the bursar's office and the financial aid office, I mean there's a lot of internal disconnects that we have to think about from the student's perspective. Um, but uh, a, a, a commitment to using that data can not only unearth um, those uh, challenges, but they can really help build uh, uh, consensus among faculty and staff that we need to be doing things differently. Data really helps sort of shake up the culture. And then it also helps build momentum for change and once you start seeing you can do things better. So I think making sure you have that analytic capacity is uh, really critical to driving forward and I think continuous improvement is the way to think about this. We're not going to invent a, a silver bullet that's going to solve our problems uh, if only we had enough money for it. We need to away at these problems and try and get better and better at them. Um, that's something we're doing at the department. We created the first uh, chief economist uh, office and we have borrowed a bunch of really uh, very uh, top rate economists and now our policy decisions are uh, better informed than ever before. We're using it to guide our conversations and trying to make data available so that people outside the department can help us with these challenges. Um, so I think the work that's happening here really is a national model for how and universities can not only tap the expertise of their own faculty, but try to bring um, others in to help them. And I know you recently launched a web series, right, to ch share best practices nationally. I know Chancellor and team got to participate in that, specifically around the partnership between Chicago Public Schools and City Colleges, which you've already mentioned in various ways, whether it's the Star Scholarship or it's the, you know, that some of your students are also CPS students because of, of how they're registered and enrolled. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that? You know, education can be so siloed, whether it's national, state, local, ver, you know, K-12 versus, you know, higher ed, et cetera. A little bit of how the administration is taking that on and trying to get this seamless, you know, system to actually work for students. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a challenge we have as a sector. Higher education is tremendously innovative and was designed way for a very long time. And you go on any corner of, of, camp, of a campus and you find tremendously committed people who are entrepreneurial and finding new ways to help serve students. We're not as good at finding that thing that's working and recognizing it and trying to do more of it. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to help with because you know every time you lift up a CUNY ASAP or, or an OMD or a bottom line or developmental education reform, you're not only offering other colleges a blueprint that they could consider adapting, but you're also taking a step in changing that culture about what students can do and whether students are college material. So to us, it's very, very important to try and identify those things that are working and lift them up and try and build awareness in the higher education community nationally. And that's why uh, Secretary Cardona invited uh, Chancellor Segato and a number of other um, inclusive higher education leaders to uh, raise the bar summit um, last August in Washington. And we're gonna keep doing that. We have a couple more planned. Uh, we're starting with the use of data because we think that's so foundational. Um, and we're gonna keep working to do whatever we can to try and identify these points of light and make sure that um, they get the recognition and the resources that they deserve and that other people are looking at them and saying, I can do that too, or maybe I can do even better. Fantastic. You've got another, since it's data and partnerships, I think you've got another opportunity <laughs> to invite the chancellor and talk about this incredible work. Um, I wanna pause just to make sure, do we have any questions from the audience? If not, we'll keep going. 
make sure people get time, not just me. All right, so we know the importance of higher education. We also know that black and Latinx women earn less money even when they are highly educated or certified. What partnerships can be leveraged at the national and local level to create more equitable financial opportunities for black and Latinx women specifically? And how can city colleges be a major partner in these conversations? I'll take, okay. I'll start, I think, uh, because I do think a lot of this work, you know, is local, can be with national companies, uh, but it is local and we have the proof point for it. I think, it, look, it is about, uh, you know, the, the first, so the first job, the first economic opportunities that you have and the quality of those economic opportunities are of critical importance and the supports that you get in those economic opportunities are of critical importance and so, we are trying to position our institution to make sure that, uh, or, you know, day by day, uh, over time, you know, we have more of those kinds of partnerships with uh, industry, so that our students have those benefits. Um, you know, the companies that we're working with, for instance, do our apprenticeship work, are um, are companies that had never welcomed our students before. They've never taken our students before, right? So you can imagine, and, and I'm sharing something they've shared public, you can imagine an Aon right down the street from Harold Washington College, you know, and kids from all across this city, right? And the only pathway for them to really get, if you're a kid from this city, to get into Aon, given the way they hired, was you had to go to a Big Ten university, graduate from that university, you know how many get accepted from our communities into those universities. Then you had to find your way into their hiring practices. And so now they're taking 24 of our students every year. <laughs> They've been doing this for five or six years, right? And the students are doing incredibly well and they're growing within the company, right? And as the CEO says, it's transformational, right? And the company is learning how to mentor and guide those students. Those students' income earning possibilities you know, and they're black and brown students that are going to Aon, right? They're changing the face of the institution. Um, and, and so we need to multiply that. And I'll say the biggest challenge is we, we need more companies. We need more companies. We need more companies taking more students um, so that every student has this kind of opportunity. Right here at Malcolm X, you know, it's not just about getting uh, a clinical rotation and an opportunity to be in the field, it's to be able to have any opportunity in the field, right? And so our partnerships uh, have evolved over time, but to include the best hospitals and healthcare centers in our, in our city, the places where, you know, you're gonna get the kind of mentorship and guidance and places that haven't always been, you know, as inclusive. And so we just have to keep doing that work. I appreciate the question because we need to think very deliberately about how we're going to build equity into our systems. And even if we were able to raise graduation rates and equalize uh, graduation rates by race, we still would not have achieved equity. We have to be looking at systems like student debt, which fall disproportionately upon borrowers of color. In fact, a typical black borrower, for every dollar they borrow, still owes 97 cents after 10 years. Um, so we see tremendous numbers of black uh, uh, households in particular struggling with student debt. And then it, it's also true that having the same credential, maybe attending the same program at the same college, does not necessarily mean you get the same career benefits, of course. So we are um, starting now, we started a couple months ago to collect um, race ethnicity data on the FAST as students start at which students and which per and we hope a really useful to start conversation about whether but we need um, another question from the audience build back better 
uh, included funding for evidence-based student supports. Is there a path forward through Congress for this type of funding? Um, if not, how else might the Department of Education support expansion of these effective programs? Well, uh, you know, we really swung for the fences and build back better and requested um, over $60 billion uh, for evidence-based student completion like OMD. And uh, we got close, um, but we didn't get there. Um, and instead, we do have uh, $50 million to uh, help the, get the ball rolling. And I think that when it talks about, when we talk about those big investments in uh, student completion, when we talk about free community college, you know, it would be wonderful to hit a walk-off grand slam in Congress and get the resources we need. And we, we actually did get pretty close, and maybe that window will open up again. But most of the time that we make progress as a country, it's not in one fell swoop. It is uh, progress being made by states, by cities, uh, by the federal government. And so I think we need to be thinking about uh, a national conversation around um, the types of investments we need to make and why it's so important that all students have the resources they need to succeed. And I know that, I got one clap for that. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, uh, I just, I know that uh, as long as President Biden is in office, he's gonna be prioritizing funding for um, the Title III and Title V programs that serve um, uh, institutions that serve students of color and low-income students. He's going to be working to increase the Pell Grant, which we've increased by $900 so far. Um, and he's going to continue advocating for free community colleges and new investments in student success, because um, that's really fundamental to, um, to his policy agenda and his vision for the country. Um, another question, which you touched a little bit on earlier, but what can local institutions like city colleges do to advance the idea of free community college? Um, and I know we have a number of different initiatives that help kids, I mean, students almost get to free. Um, but then how can researchers also contribute? How can the community contribute to advancing that conversation? Well, I, I, I might uh, say that while I think it's really important to advance free community college, and we are doing it in Chicago, uh, and the uh, undersecretary and I have had this uh, conversation, it is equally important to create the conversation around student supports. Free community college without robust student supports is just not gonna get us where we need to get, okay? Uh, and so I, I would say you know, that we, we certainly you know, want to have a more affordable higher education pathway. And that also includes the cooperation between four-year universities and two-year colleges, right? the quality of our agreements, the way we market to a community, right, at this very institution. It was only two years ago where our students had to come to our nursing program and then bounce over to UIC without a real clear pathway with fewer, you know, obstacles in the way that we were, being able, we were able to work through that. And so I think we're gonna get to freer, lower cost um, through better agreements, uh, and through understanding the value proposition, especially of a community college education. But the only thing I'll say is, let's not get to free at the expense of student supports. Let's make sure that those student supports are robust. I agree with that very strongly. And I, I think that is a useful question for the research agenda, is if we're talking about um, a community college system that sends a signal that it's open to everyone. We think everyone should be thinking about coming here. Uh, what does it mean to hold up the bargain of supporting students through that journey and giving them a good chance to graduate? So I think there's a lot of variety in the different um, state and local models for free community college now. They have different combinations of support services. Um, and there's a lot to learn about what that high level headline uh, should actually mean on the ground or how communities should be interested. And I think it's, uh, I think it is an idea with a lot of momentum. There was a landmark program implemented in New Mexico. Uh, there was a big new investment in Maine this year, uh, last year in, in California. Um, there's a new program in New Jersey. So 
It's an idea that has a lot of momentum around the country. And I think making sure that we take advantage of this opportunity to make sure that we're um, investing in tuition, yes, but also investing in paths for students to succeed um, is really a, a high priority uh, for all of us in, in higher education. Another question from the audience. Can you talk more about how City Colleges is working on supporting its students' transfer to four-year? Um, and how will you follow those students, or how do you follow those students to understand their persistence and their success? Yes. Um, first of all, can you all hear me? Is that better? Okay. Uh, so, look, I think that we've got to get away from or enhance the basic agreements that we've traditionally had with four-year institutions. You know, this sort of general uh, uh, transfer agreements that we have. We've got to have more specific agreements that move our student directly from community college into programs of study at four-year universities, right? That's the big shift that we have to make. And we're making it, you know, it should be clear. If I'm a student that has made a decision that I wanna get into, you name the field, right? I should have a suite of program agreements that are specific to me entering into that field without losing any momentum whatsoever, recognizing the hard work that I have done in my community college you know, uh, uh, journey, right, as I take the next step into that field, engineering, nursing, computer science, early childhood, you name it, right? And for us to get there, it's gonna require a number of different strategies, you know, um, and hard conversations, right, uh, between institutions, and in some cases, legislatures getting involved, right? And so, you know, we had an effort in the state of Illinois with legislators saying, community college should be able to do a baccalaureate in early childhood education because folks are never gonna make so much and because we need the workforce and, you know, a number of very good arguments. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of resistance from four-year universities. We were able to come to some agreement, um, which, you know, for the first time, all of the universities decided carte blanche to take the AAS, you know, uh, on transfer into their university. And so we got progress there. We need to do more of that kind of effort and then market those things jointly so that a student in high school knows, geez, I can do this and it's gonna cost me that much and I'll get through this pathway faster and less expensive. Um, there's a couple questions around mental health services and specifically city colleges wellness centers and i'm sure you're seeing this across the nation and you know how not only to offer those but how do you encourage and what efforts are being done to have students take you up on those services and access those services availability is very important and you know the mode that you offer for students i think is very important too and so uh, you know, we do have physical wellness centers uh, at each college. That's important. You know, there's human beings there that are qualified to receive you and work with you and refer you if necessary. Uh, but also, we have to augment that with more hours of service. It can't just be the traditional hours that we are here on campus. You know, the need for mental health supports uh, comes up at any time, in any moment. Right? So we are literally moving towards the capability to offer those supports 24 seven, you know, every day of the week, whenever a student needs it, using a variety of resources, paid staff, you know, vendors uh, uh, and, 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 and partners in order to achieve that goal. Well, this is, uh, you know, this is an issue I hear almost everywhere I go. And, um, you know, I, you know, really commend young people for um, talking so openly about uh, challenges they're facing. Um, that would be, would have been hard for me when I was their age, be hard for me now. And I think when they uh, talk about what they need, we really have an opportunity to think about how to do that. Um, there's no one strategy that's going to work for every student. So we need different uh, points of entry, different uh, levels of intensity, and we should be thinking
thinking too about a, a, a public health strategy for mental health where we are uh, promoting good practices for managing stress and managing anxiety. Uh, letting people know that it's okay uh, to take a break, it's okay uh, to ask for help, uh, and trying to build a, a broad-based culture uh, around good mental health practices. A couple questions around undocumented students and um, how you know city colleges and or you know colleges across the country are not only helping them get through um, and earn their degree, but then on to work. So you know, are there efforts to then help them after they're getting a credential from CCC to access a job? Um, yeah, so we look at our undocumented students in the same way we look at all of our students, making sure that whatever opportunity that we have at city colleges that you know is available uh, within our control, right? Obviously, you know, federal financial aid and those kinds of resources are not within our control, but those things that are within, within our control, we make sure we exercise absolute inclusion in that regard. We um, have supported and have followed up on you know, the legislature's vision for having an undocumented student liaison um, at every campus in order to make sure that that student has those extra supports that they may need given the fact that they're undocumented. The private marketplace is a very difficult one, you know, to navigate. But with this infrastructure that we have of undocumented student liaisons, we will begin to move in that direction with employers um, as we do with all of our students, right? Uh, asking for inclusion, uh, asking those companies to adapt um, in ways that are appropriate uh, for them. Okay. Um, okay, I promise to keep us on time and we're out of time. I apologize not getting to all the questions from the audience, but we're here today. Um, keep asking questions, talking to one another. I want to thank Undersecretary Qual for being here again and Chancellor Salgado for his incredible leadership in this city. Um, and thank you to all of you. I am now going to hand it over to, I believe, the podium.